Hi, this is Gadi Elkan with Selly Film News here with the team behind Echoes of War. We have director Kane Senez and writer, producer extraordinaire John Chris. Um, this is such a unique story. We, we, we see war films, but people coming home from war is not something we've always seen. And you guys have had this story for a while. You had it before the, the feature. Can you talk to us about where this sprouted from? And, and you've spent a lot of time with this story. Um, tell us a bit about it. Well, I was at film school in the States um, from Australia. Um, and basically, I was making a short film there. Uh, and John and I were living together, I believe, at the time. Um, we had met there on a set. And I just always wanted to make a film that was turn of the century. Um, I was thinking more like 1900s. Um, just because I love the era, I love the aesthetic, uh, the kind of look of a simpler time, the earthy tones. In many ways, it kind of just kind of came from like a pure aesthetic thing in a way. Um, but just the, the, the kind of feeling of being out there in the country and the fields, because I, I did not grow up that way, you know, so I was always very enamored by that. And John, being Texan, was like, well, what if we set this story 40 or so years earlier and we have this great backdrop of this war? And it became, um, became like a very crucial thing to the short because we realized, well, that changes everything, you know, like that, that, that justifies why these characters are in this situation in the story. And so we went ahead and we made the short film um, and I became very enamored with that era uh, specifically in Texas history, which I got from John. So in many ways, I don't think that this would have ever happened and it wouldn't have ever been like a Civil War story if I hadn't met John. So that's where that started. And then, and then we just decided to make the feature like a year or so later and, and, and it kind of grew from that. You know? He was wanting to make his Days of Heaven and I just yeah. happened to be off of a cattle ranch in Amarillo where I was working cattle and shipped it to LA and he was like, man, you're a, like a real Texan. You kind of like <laughs> know about this stuff. I love these films. I've always wanted to do one. So it kind of sprouted from there and then we kind of hit it off creatively and, and um, you know, really wanted to make the same type of film and have the same type of impact that uh, the filmmakers before us kind mm. of uh, did and have done. Um, and, you know, I, I think we accomplished what we wanted to with yeah. the writing and formation of that sort of unique Texas, Australian, noirish tale. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I think that what, what we're most interested in in films is characters. Mm -hmm. And so, um, obviously, you get a lot of films that are very plot heavy, um, and that's fine too. Uh, <clears throat> but we always wanted to set whatever we were going to do as our first feature length film, we wanted it to be a canvas for characters to interact and grow and get to know them. And so uh, stripping out all of the distraction, I guess, of the modern world and, and just focusing it in a time where really it's like you've got an open, just, just these planes and then a house in the middle of nowhere. And there's four people there who are around a table and the uncle has just come home from the war and they haven't seen him in five years. And so suddenly it's like, we have something to play with there and we can sit in that moment and learn about these people and what life is like back then and, and their morals and their values are different to today but still relevant. And it just, as writers and then as a director as well, it just really gives you like a focus and, and I just really appreciated that kind of, um, kind of quiet, that kind of silence to really, um, to kind of just, just sit there in that room with the candle burning and like the wind howling slightly in the background, but just focus on these relationships without everything that comes with the modern world, you know? And it lends itself so much to character development and just drama. The fact that, uh, you know, Abigail can't pick up a cell phone and, and call her other uncle and say, hey, Wade's back from the war, like what do yeah. we do? Story over, film <laughs> over, you know? It yeah. takes away all of these rationales that we have today. Mm -hmm. Call the cops, uh, you know, grab your AK-47 out of your closet or, you know, uh, talk it out with your mother or father. Well, and, and we yeah. had always loved the, 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 the tagline for the first alien film, In Space, No One Can Hear You Scream. And right. it was that idea where like, well, we're not in space, but we may as well be because we're in the middle right. of nowhere. And the nearest town is like two days ride away. So really, no one is going to hear you scream. So right. whatever happens, they're the only ones that can deal with it and it, fix it. And it there's lends, no help coming. It lends itself to that horror cabin in the woods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, we're stuck here. 
and and people undervalue that that back then you know like a day's ride was like super important and like you could die on that ride and you know i hop in the car and i drive from austin to here no big deal um so yeah i think it just it lends itself to that well it's interesting it's it's, it's an interesting form of justice or how justice can happen um with that moral side of it how much of that was in impacted in your writing and where the story goes like did you want to have that moment of even in the small isolated area there is still some form of justice that occur or yeah. couldn't you yeah know what I mean like well yeah and I think it is a very moral one um and I think that religion is a factor in our story uh, as it's very important to the time and still is and and it's like yeah there's no one necessarily to uphold those values it's just the way these these kind of guys were raised. Um, um, but I think that was very important to us, this kind of moral code that these characters have. Um, I always loved the film Straw Dogs, the original Sam Peckinpah one, where it really is about this kind of theme, is violence a rite of passage, or is it not? And, and if civilizations were formed on like the backs of violence, like the reason that we're here today is because of violence and wars, and we have that in a weird way to, to, to thank for our lives. And so we were always like, well, I mean, are any of these characters wrong for doing what they're doing? Um, are they just defending their families, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and we like to leave that up to the audience. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, just on a, you know, on a personal level, I've kind of grown up. Uh, you know, my uncle is a criminologist, sociologist, and has written books on policing in the West, you know, actual studies on how... Uh, these cultures actually policed themselves um, with lack of like formal police and, and how that all came about. And, uh, you know, my father's written about the code of the West. Um, and so there's, there's, there were these codes, there were these ideologies, there were these religion backed uh, traditions and um, things that are really alien to today. Um, and so, to see that shift, you know, for 150 years from like, hey, I've like shot 30 people, no big deal, to like where we are now to where, you know, if you get in a fist fight in public, I mean, you're gonna go to jail. Um, so this sort of self-policing and then these codes of the West were definitely things that we wanted to, to touch on. Can y'all talk about the look of the film and about, there, there's, there's definitely, I don't, I don't want to call it a signature, but there feels like y'all are, are shots are, are particularly chosen by the, the look, the lighting. They're, y'all put a lot of time into this. And yeah, I loved it. Yeah. That's yeah. all you, buddy. Well, I mean, it's you as well, because in like the writing period, I, I, I think that we oh, talked yeah. about wanting to create, we were very enamored like with film noir. And that was a thing that we were into at the time, and we still are, and, and I think it was you, you kind of were like, well, what if this is like a kind of country noir? Um, where you take the conventions of film noir in a way which, uh, which only exists in, in the uh, city, let's apply it to like the rural landscape. Um, so that was definitely a launching off point. Um, uh, my cinematographer, Wes Cardino, who's great, um, he's from upstate New York, um, so he grew up a little more in a kind of country-ish area than I did, but he kind of grew up in, in the big city. But we just kind of clicked and loved all the same films. And so it never really was, um, like we talked about it a lot and we referenced like a lot of painters, um, um, Andrew Wyeth and stuff, like these great kind of landscapes and, and just a lot of films like the Peckinpah Westerns, the ones that kind of weren't necessarily as um, glossy, had a bit of kind of more of like a kind of modern day grit to them. Um, and then we just talked, we basically just talked about just letting the era and the look of the film do the work in terms of the period, but let's just shoot this like we would any other movie. Like if we we're making a modern day movie, let's shoot it like that. Let's not necessarily have the actors talk in that old old kind of language that we're used to. Let's just have them talk the way that they would today. And and um, those kinds of things were decisions, sure. Um, and then the look, it, it's just, it was just trying to create a tone. Like it was really just, um, I'm just a fan of, I don't know, it's, it's like a slight kind of parable like it's realism, but it's not. It's kind of hyper real, and and it all exists in this kind of um, not necessarily nightmarish, but um, it's like the fairy tale that goes bad. And so we went into it with like a little bit of like the Grimm brothers references and kind of um, 
uh, like Wuthering Heights, the book was huge for us, and then the movie that Andre Arnold did uh, a few years ago as well, which was great. Um, just that very like, uh, let's approach this kind of like, not necessarily a horror, but with influences from that, and really kind of searching for the darkness in We were reading a lot of Alan Moore at that point, and, yeah. and definitely, uh, you know, on, on the writing standpoint, uh, we definitely wanted to go for this uh, sort of Hitchcock-esque uh, horror element that, uh, I don't know, that I don't think, you know, you see a lot of these days, these sort of traditional movies like Rope or uh, Shadow of a Doubt, which was a huge influence for me. Um, and I know that, you know, the relationship with Sammy and his uncle was in there as well. And we wanted that to be sort of like a twisty, eerie, horror, dark type element. Mm -hmm. And Wes definitely picked up on all of that. And, and you know, him, mm -hmm. you know, Kane mm -hmm. and Wes sort of transposed that to, to what we see on camera. But from, from the writing standpoint, I mean, definitely there's some, there's a lot of dark, uh, traditional horror, character-driven um, stifle that just kind of mm. comes across, I think, on camera. Well, and I, I, I really think it was Wes who, um, who just kind of said to me, look, I, I, I know what you guys want to do with like the horror and the edginess and the grit, but I think that there's a kind of beauty here as well. Yeah. And let's just try and make this as kind of painterly as we can. And, yeah. and at first you hear that from like a shooter and you're like, you're just trying to make this look good, you know? <laughs> but as I got to know him, I really realized that he thought it was very important to the story because all the characters are fragile in their own way and vulnerable. And he didn't want to just do the kind of um, washer of effect, like let's make them all, um, let's make them all angry. Let's make them all kind of look really messed up. Let's kind of just set this thing like a, like a, um, like a very in your face, like screaming at the audience type of film, which it, which it really could have been. And him and I really talked about just pulling all that back and just restraining as much as possible. And you watch like James Bad Badgedale's performance in it is a very good example of that because in my mind, I always thought that we were gonna have this very um, outspoken character and this very volatile character. And, and he just really um, wanted to pull everything back and, and, and do all of the talking with his eyes. And, and there's an eeriness in that but it's kind of like a quiet, it's, it's quieter. And, it, and I think the film is a lot quieter than I originally thought it would be. And I'm really happy that I listen to those guys um, because it really kind of creates something I think that is a little different where um, we're letting the audience make their decision on what the tone of the film is. It's not necessarily as obvious as, um, as like an assault on their senses. It's really just kind of like you sit back and. Um, maybe some people will find it scary. Maybe some people will find it more beautiful. You know, it just kind of sits in that middle ground. Yeah. So. I found myself putting myself in their shoes because of that. Right. Yeah. And I think that that helps with the silences or the yeah. not the silences, but the those just the stares. Especially, yeah. I feel like you you have to put yourself in what they're going through and where they're where they are to understand it. But I think we all understand the the universal side of it. it They'll do a wonderful job of that. Um, well, I, I think when you have good good actors as a director, you just kind of stand back a little bit. Just let them do their thing. Yeah. Don't, don't try to over stylize it. Just let the performances speak for themselves. And I credit that in, entirely to the cast because they really, they really had it on take one, take two, you know, like mm -hmm. they just knew what they were doing. And so it was very easy for me. <laughs> we definitely wanted to accomplish that the war touched every single one of our characters um, in its own unique way. And what was amazing was, you know, Kane bringing that out of them and just their ability as good quality actors to, um, to pull that out of themselves as well. And so, uh, you know, it was really amazing kind of setting that groundwork and then, you know, saying to the actors, okay, how did the war touch you? And I think every single one brings, a, brings about just that that little piece that you can just, like you said, put yourself in their shoes and, uh, you know, how would Doris feel losing her son to this senseless war? How would Randolph feel about losing his first son to this sen senseless war and losing all of his wealth and, and really no one there to pick him back up? How would Marcus feel uh, trapped in a relationship that no one understands and that he really can't uh, open up 
mm. to about, which gets into a lot of the things that we deal with today in modern society as of relationships and marriages and courtships and things that aren't allowed and things that are allowed. Well, they're all um, very, like the characters are all very isolated. They don't yep. really like, they have people, but they don't have anybody to turn to. Right. And so they're kind of dealing with all their own things on their own. And I think that's really where we start. And then it's all about, let's take this one character and let's drop him in into this mix. And it's like dropping kind of blood into an ocean and seeing what happens and like, are the sharks gonna come, you know? And it's really just that one ingredient and that's really what starts the whole thing. So Wade really is the catalyst um, right. in the truest sense of the term. And um, yeah, they were all just kind of like going about their, their, their daily lives before, but they were floundering. Like they're really, their lives, they were shells of themselves mm -hmm. and the war had done that. And so, yeah, if, I was, if Wade never came back, then they would just keep on, uh, keep on trucking, you know, um, not necessarily really living. And so you drop this guy in and yeah, the, the kind of week that the story takes place gets pretty chaotic, but at least they're kind of alive again in a way, you know. And he's the um, embodiment of that war that mm -hmm. sparks and touches all of them to uh, unfold uh, this week-long chaotic, you know, binge. Yeah. Binge. Good word. <laughs> yeah. A slow binge. Um, yeah. <laughs> we don't get to see a lot of Texas Civil War films. Texas is not ever really thought of when you think of the Civil War. Can y'all talk about being able to, A, showcase Texas in some extent in the backdrop of that and being able to show it here in Texas? here in a Dallas audience that mm. can relate to the fact that maybe we haven't seen a film set where you guys are setting it. And yeah. that's in itself something Dallas audiences I think will enjoy. It's definitely something that, um, it's interesting that you bring that up because the last quote unquote battle of the Civil War was in Texas, Palomino Ranch. Um, and so Texas is this overlooked um, western boundary of the war that um, is really overlooked, but there's a lot of great generals that came out of Texas. There were both uh, Irish immigrants and people fighting for the North, people fighting for the South. You had the whole Indian contingent fighting for the Confederacy. And, and um, the rebels as well. And everything. Yeah, and so you have this, this huge mythology and culture of this kind of backsplash of the Civil War. Um, kind of like, you know, what was going on with the Jayhawks in Kansas. And so it's this like little microcosm of the war. And so you hear about the atrocities of like Sherman's March and burning down Georgia and um, all of this craziness. Um, and Texas was sort of... It's for the South. Yeah, it Texas was front, just, you know? yeah, it was just kind of caught in this blizzard of like uh, craziness that was going on. And so... Um, that's why I think it's so unique is that it's not a typical um, gone with the wind to where woe is the South and it's definitely not a hurrah for uh, Lincoln, hurrah for the North. It's more of this weird uh, pre-reconstruction sort of blank canvas that we pulled reality from and sort of... Um, you know, dropped that little mm. droplet mm -hmm, of blood mm -hmm. in into this like sea of grass. You know, well, take the water away and put the grass there. Yeah. And um and you know, there were sharks, there were angels, yeah. there were monsters, there were demons out there that people just don't really care about anymore. I think it's the right place for a home front story because yeah, you hear about like the fighting on the front. Um um and Kansas and all of that. And I just think that for our story, um, this little kind of area that is quite tucked away um, is the place that you least really expected this to happen. Right. Uh, and there are probably like a, a thousand of these kind of, kinds of stories. And, and yeah, it's based on research and um, uh, there, there are facts in there, but it's a fictional story. And who knows if this happened or not? I mean, it's very, it's, 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 it, it's possible, and we never would have known because, like, the media didn't exist back then, and so, so um, um, it really was the right stage for this. And kind of showing it to a Dallas audience, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I think it's fitting that we world world premiere this film in Texas. Um, I know that there are a lot of people that are very interested in the Civil War. 
I would like to just open the discussion up by showing this film maybe on like that kind of slice of life on the home front that maybe they aren't that accustomed to. That's not what they're taught at schools. It's not really about the battles. It's more about like, hey, it's very easy in a way to say that war is bad and see the body count on the battlefields. But what about the ones that do survive? And we're all like, oh, great. But it's not that great because they have to come home and deal with that and there's trauma involved. And PTSD is something that is all, is all around the news today, but it didn't, that, that, that term didn't exist back then. So they didn't know ha what was going on with these guys. Um, it wasn't categorized yet. And so this, in a way, is a, a, an example of a family who has never heard of that t term or who has never dealt with that, has never been told that war can change you psychologically. And then just like thrusting a soldier into their lives and being like, you have to deal with this. And none of them really know what's wrong with him. And it really takes them a while to be like, hey, there is something wrong with him. And at that point, it's like, well, is it too late? So that's really kind of what the story is about as well. Um, so it was an interesting time and I yeah, people ask why did you set, set it back then when we were trying to make the film, they were like, well, why don't you just set it in like modern out in, day. yeah, modern day, it'll be a lot e easier to make. And I'm like, B because the story just would not exist. Um, it's entirely about that era um, and about the lack of resources and the lack of knowledge that we now have. Um, and on the eve of the, you know, end of the Civil War, after 150 years, you know, here we are now showing a little film highlighting things that really aren't talked a lot about. Mm. Um, and that are still relevant because yeah. the concepts are still relevant. There are soldiers who are returning with, with these kinds of issues, you know, and, and there's still, that many years later, we still haven't really s solved that problem. Yep. There's still not the adequate care for these guys and so I mean I'd like to go and show this to like like a veterans group and see what they think because I mean you've got liberties in a way because everybody processes trauma differently so no one is but um, I, I do think that it's relevant um, not necessarily why we made the film but I like to think it's got a I don't know I, I just like to think that it's it's there's something in it for people maybe that have gone to war and, and if nothing else, like I always said to John when we were making it, if someone can, who has been there and done that, um, can appreciate that and say that there's a kernel of truth in there, then for me, then that's, then we've done our job, you know? Well, thank you guys for setting it in that time period and making yeah. it because it, it is eye-opening and it's, it does feel educational. It feels like I am learning something even though I'm here in Texas and yeah. I didn't know all that. Even though it's not necessarily in the plot, you do kind of get the history of what's going on and you do learn that the family dynamics are a bigger picture. Um, thank you guys so much and I can't wait to see what audiences feel about the world from here. Thank, thank you. you guys. Us too. Thanks, Thanks so you. much. Thanks, John. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Yeah.